Hello and welcome to an introduction to using traditional high-performance computing. My name is Gavin Pringle, I'm from EPCC at the University of Edinburgh, and this presentation is part of the Comp Biomed Centre of Excellence. I shall make some of this material, uh, these slides, available after the presentation, after this video. Um, and if you'd like to reuse any of that, that's fine, but please do uh, give credit. So this is uh, just a rough uh, idea of a, a generic parallel computer or a cluster it's sometimes called. So here we've got a, a rough conceptual model of a collection of, collection of laptops. We've got five laptops and they are connected together by uh, ethernet cables. Um, so this is pretty much what an HPC system looks like. Uh, you can consider each laptop as what we call a compute node and each node or laptop has a processor, a hard disk, memory, operating system, etc. And each runs a copy of an operating system, uh, typically Linux. Um, and let's say each laptop here has four cores. Then for this system, we have a total of 20 cores available to us. Now, typical HPC system looks like this, where you have a set of login nodes um, and these nodes um, uh, have multiple cores and these nodes are on the internet. So here you could use them using a system called Secure Shell or SSH. So you have a terminal to log in and out of the login nodes and you can move data on and off the computer uh, using what we call maybe SCP as an example. And you upload or download data Onto, via the login nodes and it will be saved onto disk. These login nodes are shared use, so you don't have exclusive use of them, so there will be other people on these nodes, so please do respect them, that, and that would mean you don't run applications on the login nodes. They're only for compiling applications, maybe some light pre and post processing of data. And then there are the compute nodes. So like the login nodes, these also have multiple cores. There are many, many more nodes than the login nodes. And these nodes are not on the internet and they can only be accessed by the login nodes via a job scheduling system, a system we call a batch system. So any serial or parallel application should be run on these nodes. These nodes are typically run in exclusive access. So only you will have access to the nodes that you request. Some HPC platforms also permit shared use. And um, I wonder if you can think of benefits of exclusive versus shared. Exclusive, for instance, um, you would have your own node all to yourself, which means um, you wouldn't have other users slowing your code down. On the other hand, if you wanted to use, say, a half of a node, then um, you wouldn't want to pay for the whole node, so you would let other users use the other half. So those are just two examples. So these slides pretty much repeat what I've just said. So accessing uh, the login nodes, as I said, is usually used uh, via SSH, and if you're on a Mac's, Mac or a Linux machine, uh, there's the command terminal, or there's an application called MOBA Xterm. And on Windows machine, uh, you have applications, uh, PuTTY is quite a traditional one. Uh, MOBA Xterm again is also available on Windows machines. MOBA Xterm can help with setting up port forwarding and graphics and other more complicated things. Now, when you're on the HPC system, you'll have to edit a file. Um, and this is typically done using either Emacs or Vim. These are two editors available um, on traditional HPC resources. Here we can just about see uh, an example of a, a batch script. So this batch script, what, what is it exactly? So it's a it's a batch system is a, a mechanism to submit and run your jobs on the compute nodes. So remember, many users are sharing all the compute nodes. So we want a fair 
distribution of resources. And so that's what the batch system does is you will specify the number of cores that you want or the maximum job time. Um, maybe you specify the budget that you want to charge against and um, how many cores per node, that kind of thing. And then the system will reserve that block of resources. So it'll, it'll say, okay, this is six hours on 20 nodes. Um, and it'll wait until that block is available for you in a fair way. And then when you get this block of resources, you can use this block any way you want. So if you have a single job that spans all the cores for all six hours, maybe you want uh, many shorter jobs that run one after another in a workflow. Maybe you had uh, multiple smaller jobs all running concurrently. And these jobs might be serial or parallel. So how do you use a batch system? Well, there's three steps to it. The first is to write a job script, which uh, you would specify, as I said, the number of cores, maximum job, uh, what's called the wall clock time. And then also the commands that you want to run once these resources are allocated to you. The second thing is you, you submit this job script to the batch system and it'll be executed whenever the resources become available. Now that script or job will run until either one, it finishes successfully or two, it's terminated because of errors, so it crashes or three, it runs so long that it actually hits the maximum wall clock limit that you gave in your batch script. And then the last step is just to examine the output or any error messages uh, from the job. But what about performance? Do we care about parallel performance? Surely we just want to go as fast as possible. So we run applications in parallel to get solutions more quickly and or the uh, problems can be larger. So if we use, let's say, 10 times more cores, then you would hope that it would run 10 times faster. Or maybe you could run a, a problem that was 10 times bigger. Unfortunately, it is always less than 10 times. And measuring parallel performance can help us understand why this is, whether our application is making an efficient use of the cores, and, and if not, how best to use the application with the available resources. And to do that, we introduce performance metrics. There are really two key measurements here. The first one is execution time, which is essentially just how long it takes from when it starts running to when it stops running. Here we're defining this as the execution time as capital T, and that's based on the size of the problem, N, and the number of cores that you're running on. Um, and then we can define the speed up, so the speed up on the same size, on the same number of cores, is the time running that system on one core divided by the time running that system on C cores. And then parallel efficiency is defined as the speed up defined by the number of cores you used. Or uh, you can expand that out to the time on one core divided by the number of cores times the time on that number of cores. So this is an example of uh, execution times where um, we have the number of cores along the bottom, um, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and the time on the vertical axis. Notice this is a log log graph. Um, it presents the data much more clearly Otherwise, you'd have so much more white space on the graph. So as the core count increases, the blue line here is the, the, the time for the application. The time also decreases as you introduce more and more cores until it levels out and then starts increasing again. This, um, it starts increasing again because the communication has now started to dominate. So you're no longer just running computation, you're now busy communicating. So the fastest time here is 16 cores. This yellow line is called perfect scaling and appears as a straight line on a log log graph. 
uh, and essentially says if you run 32 cores, you run 32 times faster than on one core. So uh, a discussion of that graph, I've, I've already said this first half, but so the execution time, as we saw, shows that 16 cores is the fastest. But is that really an efficient use of the cores? So we look at the parallel efficiencies. So here they are for this particular example. So again, we have the number of cores along the bottom, but this time we have parallel efficiency on the vertical axis. And it's no longer a logarithm, it's just a linear axis now. So we start with 100% um, uh, on one core, and then this reduces down as the number of cores increases. So typically what we use is a parallel efficiency of 70%. So this would be uh, eight cores. So one would find this problem on eight cores. Now, if you remember, 16 cores was the fastest, but you can see that that efficiency was actually 50% which is quite poor, really. Perfect for shared nodes. Um, you would uh, use eight cores. That's because you get the most efficiency. But on exclusive use nodes, where you have to pay for all the cores in a single node, then you would, as in this case, 32 cores in a node. You should really let run on 16 cores. That's the fastest time. So even though it's not the most uh, efficient, it's the fastest because you are running in exclusive use. So this is uh, essentially what I've just said there. I think we did more testing and we discovered that 24 cores was faster than 16 cores and a worse parallel efficiency, but it, it was faster. But again, if you're gonna be running in shared use, or if you've got hundreds, thousands of nodes in the future, then uh, you have to consider um, parallel efficiency, not just how fast it goes. So I'd like to finish with uh, some common mistakes that you are going to make, so, uh, because uh, you're just starting out. First one is you, there's no output from your batch system. So you might try, doubling the amount of time that you've given to your simulation or, or doubling the number of cores. Maybe it's not running fast enough. But in fact, what's happening if you have no output is uh, it's called um, a hanging script. So your batch script essentially doesn't have a, a carriage return character at the very last line. And the way to solve this is just to make sure that you have a couple of blank lines at the end of your batch file. Sometimes you might find that as you double the number of cores, the time for your simulation doesn't get any faster. This is typically because you're, uh, you're not running it correctly. There's something wrong and it's causing it to run in serial. So perhaps uh, you have forgotten to use the parallel job launcher, which takes uh, uh, application and will run it in parallel for you. These are uh, S run, AP run, MPI run, MP run, these are just examples. So when you run your job in parallel, uh, you have to make sure that the total number of cores that you've requested is the same as the total number of tasks you're running multiplied by the total number of threads you're running. Python, for instance, will be running a threads only and won't be running in tasks. And the way you set the number of threads is using this export omp num threads and then n is the number of threads you want to run on. You might forget to check the standard out file. There are two files generated when you run on a batch system. It's the standard out and the standard editor. Um, so th this is the job name uh, followed by a dot O and then the number that the batch system gave your job. More common mistakes. Um, leaving lots of unnecessary files lying around, this wastes uh, a lot of disk space and typically disk space is a shared resource amongst all users especially of your group so failed jobs for instance will generate what is what are called core files and these are very large uh, um, uh, best to just delete them uh, unless you're debugging of course sometimes um, you will register an email to use the HPC service 
just to get on quickly, but then you might forget to check that email. So uh, if there's error messages, or there's maybe a system and announcement, or somebody's contacting you about use, then you have to uh, actually access that email. So uh, we recommend setting up a forwarding mechanism to the email that you use most regularly. Um, another uh, common mistake is to consume your total budget allocation in one night. So um, what's best before you run any applications is really best to just type run a simple what we call a hello world job just to convince yourself that uh, your system is working and it's running in parallel. Uh, finally, uh, oot or out of memory during as, as you're running it, um, you might request or allocate more memory than is physically available within the node. Uh, traditional HPC systems do not allow you to swap to disk, which is uh, what laptops typically do. Um, and so your system will just crash and just stop. So you, you'll typically have to allocate more cores to your application. And finally, ask for help. We've all made these mistakes ourselves. Perhaps I've made more than others. <laughs> Okay, uh, so this is the last slide. Um, if you're new to HPC, then I would recommend um, switching this video off and actually start playing. The rest of the slide deck associated with this video contains uh, about 20 more slides and they're designed for the curious. You want to progress to the next level or you want to intend, you, know, you intend to publish your results and so you'll need a bit more of the uh, vocabulary. And so um, I shall just leave you with uh, a photograph of one of the more beautiful supercomputers we have in Comp Biomed Centre of Excellence. This is one of our core partners, BSC in Barcelona. The name of this, this machine is Mare Nostrum. It built inside a disused church and it is inside a glass box. And you can actually see underneath the floor, you can see the cooling units. And each of these servers contains a number of nodes in each of these racks. So there'll be cores inside each node, inside each rack, inside each block. And so there's, there's a lot of cores here. Okay, thank you very much.